Okay, folks, this is your five-minute warning. Five-minute warning. All right, folks, I'm going to ask you to begin finding your seats or returning to your seats in earnest. Mrs. Thompson has instructed me that my job is to keep things moving. I said, well, maybe you shouldn't have a preacher MC, because that, uh... and so if, I, if I'm standing behind you and you feel a tug at your coattail, that means to move it along. And if you don't have a coattail, just know I'm going to tug at something. Amen. God bless you. At this time, it's my privilege to present Bishop Dr. Kevin Woodgett, pastor of the Church of the Living, Christ, Living God and outgoing president of the CCCC. We say greetings to everyone this morning. All right, and good morning. I, we're so glad that most of you have braved the cold and are in here. How many feel warm and full? All right, raise your hands. Good, good, good. Put your hands together for all of those that fixed this food and prepared and put this program together. 
I'm here today to uh, greet you as the president of the Collector Coalition of Concerned Clergy. I welcome you to a time-honored tradition uh, that was set forth more than 30 years ago by a group of clergy who established in Muncie a celebration that had never before taken place. I greet you on behalf of the shoulders of the many clergy in this room even stand on, whose names are not mentioned in the program, but however were instrumental in the celebration of this day here in Muncie. For it was over 30 years ago that the Collective Coalition of Concerned Clergy began the celebration in the lobby of First Merchants Bank, and as it expanded, so did its collaboration with Borg Warner, Ball State, Ivy Tech, and other sponsorship throughout the Muncie community. And some of those sponsors we still have today. Can you put your hands together for those sponsors? We say thank you for your contribution to the enrichment of this Martin Luther King Day celebration. We ask that you all plug in to our evening celebration at 6 p.m. at Union Missionary Baptist Church, which is also an intricate part of the Martin Luther King Day celebration. With our theme being 2020 vision, acknowledging our blind spots, the word blind spot is not always something that you cannot see or, or something, an impairment, but also sometimes it means the failure to acknowledge. So I felt I should greet you on the shoulders of those which this event stand. Reverend Sumter, Reverend Moore, Bishop Shelby, Reverend Crooms, Bishop S. Michael Milburn, Pastor Edwards, Reverend W.J. Jackson, Pastor Carther, Superintendent James Lawson, Bishop Mitchell, Bishop Abram, Reverend Fuller, Reverend Long, Bishop Maynard, Hurley Goodall, Roy C. Bewley, and the many others who have served the Muncie community down through the years. Enjoy today, but never forget the shoulders that you stand on. We thank you. We hope that you enjoy all that we have prepared and we greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Dr. Susanna Rivera, Rivera Mills. Good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure and the blessing of serving as Provost and Executive Vice President of Ball State University. And I am so pleased to be here with you this morning for my second MLK Day in Muncie. As some of you know, I joined Ball State and the Muncie community a little over a year and a half ago. And I remain very grateful for the way the university and the community have embraced my family and me. My husband, Sean, my son, Daniel, and I are all very honored to be with you today to celebrate the life and work of Dr. King and to pay tribute to him. Decades later, Dr. King's words and legacy continue to resonate with all of us and with millions around the world. We remember him as a civil rights leader, but he was also a teacher and a preacher. And as a preacher dedicated to the work of equity, inclusion, and social justice. He was often inspired by passages such as Isaiah 58. In fact, he included some of those verses in his I Have a Dream speech, verses that continue to call all of us to lose the chains of injustice and lighten the burdens we place on others, to set the oppressed free and remove the chains that bind people to share food with the hungry and provide shelter for the homeless and the immigrant, to clothe the naked and not hide from those who need our help. As we honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I encourage all of us to celebrate, reflect, learn, and serve. Celebrate on the hard sacrificial work that has been done this far reflect on our own role and the responsibility to continue to support and advance that work, learn about our community's people 
needs, challenges, and opportunities, and serve our community, our schools, and neighbors. Dr. King said that life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? As we celebrate today, we also have the opportunity to reflect on what that question means to each of us. King declared, and I quote, that human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle, the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. We know that the journey up to this point has not been easy. It required determination, resilience, and persistence. And we know the journey is not over, and there is much work that remains to be done. But as I look across this room today to all of you, and as we celebrate Dr. King and Ball State's 40th Unity Week, I am confident that our passion and dedication will help us reach Dr. King's goals in making this holiday for all the people, all the time, to be used for service and celebration of justice for years to come. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this celebration, and I hope you will enjoy the day. Thank you. If I may, uh, to my left at this table here, to the left, we see a table full of our first responders. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, them, uh, all of you. Thank you for serving. Thank you for being the men and women who run into danger when some of us are running away. So thank you. It is now my distinct honor to present his honor, Mayor Dan Ridenour. Good morning. You know, Dr. King has had a, a massive imp impact on all of our lives and is clearly an example of the type of leaders that we should all be. And as, we, as I look across this room, before I read the proclamation from the city of Muncie, I would just ask uh, that each of us, as leaders, because we're all leaders of our homes, we're leaders of our neighborhoods, we're leaders of our cities, uh, we're leaders of our churches, we're leaders of our employers. Um, it's important that we try and model and, and take the similar actions to what Dr. King has taken. Uh, we can have that impact and we can help continue his great legacy. So please keep that in mind as I read this proclamation from the city of Muncie. Whereas Monday, January 20th, 2020, will mark the 37th observance of the national holiday honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and work. And whereas 56 years ago, the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of this creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And whereas Dr. King fought against barriers that prohibit the rights and limit opportunities of any person regardless of race, creed, or color, and whereas he led a nonviolent movement that summoned all kinds of people, people of color, white, rich, and poor, to stimulate the moral consciousness of America, and whereas the United States of America and the city of Muncie celebrate the life and achievements of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a federal holiday marking his birthday, and whereas we embrace our important role in bringing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream to reality. Now, therefore, I, uh, the Honorable Dan Ridenour, mayor of this great city of Muncie, Indiana, declare today to be January 20th, 2020, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day in the city of Muncie, Indiana. Thank you.
have some music? We do have music? Okay. You don't want me to do the music. You really <laughs> All right. At this time, we'll call Governor Davis and Miss Megan Polliné to come and render a musical selection. This is where you do a cappella. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see. No, I won't be afraid. No, I won't be afraid. Just as long as you stand, stand by me. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, stand by me. Oh, stand by me, oh Lord, stand by me. If the sky that we look upon may tumble and fall, or the mountains should crumble to the sea. I won't cry, I won't cry, no, I won't shed a tear just as long as you stand, stand by me. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, stand by me. Oh, Lord, stand by me. Oh, Lord, stand by me. Whenever you're in trouble, won't you stand by me? Oh, stand by me. Oh, stand, stand by me, stand by me. It is only when he stands by us can we stand by each other? Thank you.
Now, would you please welcome Watasha Barnes Griffin. Good morning. At the heart of Dr. King's philosophy was the concept of service. As we gather here today to honor him, we must remember that he sought to forge the common ground on which people from all walks of life could join together as equals to address important community issues. I am Watasha Barnes Griffin, co-chair of the Martin Luther King Dream Team, along with Yvonne Thompson, the MLK Dream Team is a coming together of a diverse group of individuals, organizations, and educational entities working together to promote the ideologies of Dr. King. Throughout the year, MLK Dream Team partners with the Collective Coalition of Concerned Clergy on initiatives that rally our community, to community together around issues of justice, equality, and equity. The purpose of the Martin Luther King Dream Team is to stimulate, promote, and foster harmonious relationships among all people, provide a venue for candid dialogue, develop and sponsor community activities and educational programs for youth and adults, promote and facilitate services for those in need through a network of organizations, work to dispel racial stereotypes and intolerance, and work to be activists for nonviolent social change. The Martin Luther King Dream Team was founded in 2003 by Beatrice B. Moten Foster. Mrs. Moten Foster was a civil rights activist who participated in the historic 1965 march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. She later moved to Muncie, where she founded the Muncie Coalition of 100 Women, the Muncie Times, organized the Indiana Black Expo Muncie chapter, and created a citywide celebration for Black History Month. In 2000, yes. In 2011, Ms. B. Moden Foster passed away, yet her legacy continues to fuel the MLK Dream initiatives. As stated, the MLK Dream Team is the coming together of a diverse group of entities working together to promote the ideologies of Dr. King. So members, would you please stand if you are here? MLK Dream Team members. The Martin Luther King Dream Team hosts a variety of community and youth events throughout the year. This past Saturday, we were able to host the annual MLK Youth Citizenship Awards where 128 Delaware County students and their families gathered in the auditorium of Muncie Central High School to be honored for possessing qualities similar to those of Dr. King. Those qualities such as integrity, leadership, and the drive to make a difference in their schools was celebrated on Saturday. On February the 1st, we will host our Black History Month kickoff event. This annual event features complimentary breakfast, the arts, MLK essay winners, a community race relations survey presentation, and a silent auction to benefit MLK Dream Team projects. Thank you to Minatrista for hosting and Mutual Bank for the cash prizes for essay winners. In February, we also host our Black History Month food drive. And this food drive takes place throughout the Muncie Community Schools District. Students and staff donate food items that are delivered to Christian Ministries with the assistance of the Muncie Sanitary, Muncie Sanitary District to help those in need. So we thank Muncie Community Schools and Muncie Sanitary District for their assistance. In May, on May 7th, we host the National Day of Prayer. This is set to take place in the City Hall Auditorium on May the 7th at 11.30, and you all are invited to participate. The Walk of Fame is located in Heakin Park. It is a historical project led by the MLK Dream Team, Muncie Public Library, and the City of Muncie. The project is a quarter mile walking path lined with engraved plaques that tell the story of those who made a difference in the civil rights movement in our community. 
The welcome plaque is located directly across from the Vietnam War Memorial in Heakin Park. The Freedom Bus, our mobile civil rights museum, which is named Miss B in honor of B. Moden Foster, is a mobile exhibit that brings civil rights history to individuals, schools, and special events throughout the community. The Freedom Bus is on display today at Muncie Central for the youth event and will be open for public visits from 1130 to 1. We conduct voter registration drives. We provide, provide scholarships to high school seniors via the I Have a Dream Community Collaborative Scholarship with Indiana Black Expo and NAACP. And this year, we are facilitating the Race Relations Survey 2020. Race relations have been a focus of research beginning even before the studies conducted by Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois in 1930s. The dynamics of racial interactions have received consistently high levels of attention by researchers and policymakers since the early 1900s. And so race relations surveys in our community have two purposes. One is of an academic understanding for the purpose of theory building, and the second is for providing an understanding that serves to guide policy and program development around improving race relations in our community, both in 2000 and in 2020. The MLK Dream Team and partner groups want to learn about your perspectives on race relations in the Muncie, Delaware County communities. We seek to improve race relations beyond the talk. This information will be compared to the survey conducted about 20 years ago by Molly Flotter, Teamwork for Quality Living, Community Volunteers, Dr. Ione, Ann Brown, Lisa Rich, and Dr. Melinda Massinio. We want to know the successes and identify where we can improve. And so the MLK Dream Team, along with survey chair Steve Robert, Dr. Melinda Massinio, and the BSU Sociology Capstone students will use the results to create an action plan to address our community's race relations concerns and needs. I think on, if you back up one slide for me, you will see 20, 20, 2000 survey and then our digitized 2020 survey. So MLK invites you to share your thoughts and experiences about race relations in our community. Help us identify our community strengths, changes, challenges, and priorities. We appreciate you taking time to complete this 10-minute survey. Your responses will all be voluntary, and you will not be identified in any way. On your tables, you can simply scan the code with your phone, complete the race relations survey, or use the link that is also available. We are also looking for partner organizations to help us spread this word. The survey, our MLK Dream Team meeting times, and all our events and initiatives can be found on our website at mlkdreamteam.org. See you at Minatrista on Saturday, February the 1st, 2020, for the Black History Month kickoff event. And thank you for your time. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Rhonda Ward and uh, Jim Williams, will you be presenting together? Is that, is that I take it? Okay. Come forward, please, with some... Oh, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. They said to pronounce it Dr. K because they didn't think I could pronounce Kwiatkowski. So <laughs> I am... Uh, I'm just going to say, Dr. K, come on up, please. <laughs> well, that is impressive. Good morning. On behalf of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Planning Committee, superintendents and school corporation CEOs throughout Delaware County, I would like to congratulate all the top academic students this morning. The students being recognized are all seniors and were selected for their honor due to their outstanding academic achievement. When I call each student, I would like for them to come forward to receive their certificate from Ms. Rhonda Ward and Mr. Jim Williams. 
Also, I would like for their parents and the administrators to stand as well. We'll begin with Burris Laboratory School, Principal Dawn Miller. The first student, Megan Dragic. Bracken Carnes. Hmm. Hannah Kreider. Christina Volpe. Our next school district is going to be from Cowan High School. How about if I have the students from Cowan come up and then I'll start calling your names? Their principal is Patrick Bloom. Our first student is Gabriella Belcher. Elijah Hudson. So Elijah, how tall are you? Okay. <laughs> Everybody's wondering, so we just wanted to find out. Alexis Pinnock. Alexis Quirk. Simon Underwood. <laughs> Our next school district, Indiana Academy, Executive Director Dickie, Dr. Vicki Barton. We'll begin with Javon Dixon. <laughs> Labria Williams. Next up, my all-time favorite, Muncie Central High School, Principal Chris Walker. Yeah. 
And please make sure parents stand when your student's name is called. Gracie Evans. <laughs> Kathleen Hunter. Amelia Onyate. <laughs> Laura Rogers. Hunter Seagraves. <laughs> Dylan Stafford. Nathaniel Southwick. Now, Nate, you passed seven AP court tests last semester or last year. Yes, that is outstanding. Benito Vargas. <laughs> They're coming from every direction. And Logan Williams. Hi, Logan. Wapahani, Principal Mark Fahey. And first up will be Kaylee Fender. J.C. Fultz. Emma Shuck. <laughs> Olivia Smith. Alexis Wolf. Yorktown High School Principal Stacy Brewer. And first up will be Hannah Avila. <laughs> Edward Smallstig. <laughs> Hannah 
Before I congratulate students, I first wanted to share that at our last school board meeting, our board of trustees requested that the administration look into the amount that we would be able to um, give to teachers for raises for next school year. And so we want you to know that we, are, we want to take care of our teachers. So you can give me an amen for that. <laughs> Let's give all of our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. top academic students one final applause. Congratulations. Amen. <laughs> Let's make sure when that happens, I say when that happens, when they open that first paycheck, they don't say, hey, man. They say, hey, man. <laughs> hey, man. All right. All right. Would Reverend W.C. Edwards please come to the stage? For 51 years, I've been close to her. <laughs> and you very seldom see one without the other. But we stand today to introduce our speaker, who really doesn't need an introduction. If you read the bio on your page, but 49 years ago, we gave this child to God. And every now and then, in them 49 years, God has to touch me and say, she's mine, not yours. <laughs> and I've learned to understand that. God has done wonderful things for this young lady. She's a, a great success that we've seen 300 miles away, but she's from good old Muncie, Indiana. Oh, <laughs> now I want to let my wife introduce this great young lady. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be here because I have the pleasure of introducing to some and presenting to others a very, very fine young lady. Every once in a while, I, I question what God is doing in her life, and I question her, and then I get a small voice that says, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> So I just want to say that she has made us very, very proud. And being from Muncie, and so many of you know her, she has made you proud too. So today, Muncie, I bring to you, present to some, and introduce to others, Reverend Dr. Stacy L. Edwards Dunn.
This is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed in the, is the man and the woman who trusteth in him. We thank and praise God on this day for this opportunity to be here at Ball State. Who would have ever thunk that a young girl from Muncie, Indiana, that some teachers even said would never make it through college, would be standing before you today. So I thank and praise God for this opportunity. To Mayor Rydenor, to uh, Dr. Joffrey Mearns, the president of Ball State, to Dr. Susanna Rivera Mills, um, who has spoken to us today, to the president of the Concerned Clergy, Dr. Kevin Woodgett, and all ministers, clergy present, to the Divine Nine, and specifically to my sisters and my sorors of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I see you back there, ladies. I see you, sorors. To the students, to the faculty, and to all officials, and to all the citizens of Muncie, Indiana, and who Dr. Freddie Haynes would say, Lottie Dottie and everybody. What's up, <laughs> Muncie, Indiana? How y'all doing? It's good to be home. I also want to thank and praise God for my parents who you just um, heard from. I'm just very grateful to have my parents alive. Um, my parents make it down to Chicago often to visit, but I'm just so grateful for their ongoing support and their prayers for they are my rock. And it's a blessing when you are able to grow up with your hero and your shero in your home, for they are my hero and my shero and I would not be who I am without them. And so I thank and praise God for them. <laughs> to my siblings and my family who are here, my siblings and my nieces and nephews, they are in my house in here as well. My sister Nadine is here. We're celebrating her birthday today. And so we say happy birthday to her. To all the rest of my family as well all those aunts and uncles here who raised me here in Muncie. I was blessed when I was coming out to get my bre breakfast. You could have bought me for a penny because my line sisters that I pledge with down at Indiana University, Gamanu Chapter 27 Blessed, they surprised me, so they're here. And so I got to give a shout out to my sisters um, who are here as well. And so again, I just thank and praise God for you. My daughter was supposed to be here. She's at, at my brother's house. She's five, going on 55, Shiloh Dunn. <laughs> Shiloh Dunn was up till three o'clock in the morning, so I told him to keep her there because she would have turned it out this morning. <laughs> and so I had them keep her there. My husband is in Chicago. Chicago. He was not able to make it, but I honor him today as well. Again, I say good morning, for today we are gathered here. We gathered here join men, women, and children of a variety of ethnicities, faith, as well as social economic backgrounds all over the world as we commemorate and celebrate one of the world's greatest leaders of social justice and civil rights, the drum major for justice, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Although many will choose to remember the doc Dr. King as a beacon of civil rights movement and limit his work or water down his work uh, to his I Have a Dream speech, to which he said eventually and immediately became a nightmare, many, as noted by Khalil Gibran Muhammad, will fail to remember and acknowledge the fact that Dr. King never positioned himself as a paragon of progress, but he worked within institutions to transform broken systems and served as a stimulator against complacency. Yeah. Now more than ever, we find ourselves standing in a moment where the words of, uh, in the work of this revolutionary and radical change agent, Dr. Martin Luther King, should be taken seriously. We can't just celebrate history uh, or relegate Dr. King to a dream or hear a speech and go back to our classes, our desks, our homes, and do business as usual. Because today in 2020, we must re remember the real Dr. King, the one who chose not to be popular, but prophetic. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
Mm -hmm. The one who found himself taking on a society that he loved, but criticized it because he knew, like we know today, that we stand at the crossroads between choice and challenge in the midst of one of the most chaotic as well as dark moments in life and the moral health of our country. Dark moments when violence in our community, in our world is at an all time high, both at the street level as well as at the governmental level. Dark moments when the rights of women, children, LGBTQ, brown and black people are being destroyed. Dark moments when we live in a country with schizophrenia, a country that will say one thing and do another. Dark moments when uh, we live in a country when we're more than nine million people are losing health care and millions will lose jobs as a result of the repeal of Affordable Health Care Act due to the lies and agreed of some officials. Dark moments when race, religion, class, and money is being used to pit people against the other. Dark moments when our country has a neurotic sickness and septic commitment to racism, poverty, and militarism that is destroying the soul of America. Dark moments when there are accusations about administra the administration's collaboration with a foreign country by the name of Russia. Dark moments when our children can't safely play on the streets and, uh, and, our young, and there are lack of updated books and educational resources in our school. And our young men and women are being snatched and seduced into the $32 billion human trafficking economy. And beloved, as we stand in the midst of chaotic and dark times, we must have more than a dream, but we must wake up and get in formation because hope and unity is knocking at midnight and it's time for us to accept the challenge to be the change that we want to see. And today, beloved, I believe that Dr. King's life and legacy challenges us with some lessons for us to live out loud for, one, what, might, for, one, for what one might call this present, present age and generations to come. First, Dr. King's life, le life and legacy teaches us that we will have to have the strength to love. Somebody say strength to love. Dr. King was an instrument of love. See, for Dr. King, love was not to be confused with the sentimental outpouring and emotional nonsense. But he understood love as a social and political force for change and the most potent instrument available in mankind's quest for peace and security. He believed that a divine loving presence is what bounds all life and what makes uh, life, what the artist Estelle says, so easy. In his book, Strength to Love, love was the basis of the statement when he said this, do not conform, do not conform is difficult advice in a generation when crowd pressures and peer influences have consciously conditioned our minds and feet to move to the rhythmic drumbeat of status quo or doing what everyone else is doing. See, King understood, uh, understood, my brothers and sisters, in the midst of so much racial tension, frustration, and hate that many of the crowds had chose to hate the status quo instead of love. However, he urged, urged all those around them to, want, to not walk to the beat of the status quo and hate on each other because hate only adds deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. See, King declared with his mouth and his life that hate could not drive out hate, but only light could do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. King's words still resound loudly for us today because love is still the most durable power in the world. Love, not money, how many followers you have on social media or what your brand is, but love has the ability to change the world. Love is the key that unlocks the door, which ultimately leads to justice and equality for all. Love spurs action and enables us to be present for our sisters and brothers who are suffering. 
And if we reach into and beyond ourselves and tap into the transcendent moral ethic of love, we too, like kings, shall be able to overcome the evil set before us daily and unite people, places, and things. Beloved, as we move forward in our daily walk, let loving fiercely be our guide in all that we do so that we might change things for the better. Let each of us be a light to the darkness and be loved when hate seeks to show its ugly head. Beloved, we must have the strength to stick with love because hate is too great a burden to bear. King teaches us, my brothers and sisters, that we must have the strength to love. Somebody say strength to love. But he also teaches us this, that we also must have the strength to resist. Somebody say strength to resist. Dr. King resisted, y'all. And he was committed to resist racism, oppression, hateration, and injustice in any form. He said, and I quote, a threat to justice in, er, anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. Dr. King uh, uh, used a nonviolent resistance strategy, steeped in love to defeat injustice, poverty, racism, and militarism, and to ensure social and interpersonal change. While others advocated for freedom by any means necessary, King used the power of words and acts of nonviolent resistance, such as grassroots organizing, civil disobedience, protest, and withdrawing of dollars from institutions that perpetuated hate and constantly believing that the universe is on the side of justice to achieve goals that seemed impossible. And like King, we too can accomplish the seemingly impossible. If we commit ourselves to the unwavering, active resistance to any policies that perpetuate hate, evil division, injustice, discrimination, and inequality. We, un we also have to hold fast to our belief that we can live up to this country's yet unrealized promise of life, liberty, and justice for all. If we truly honor what King stood for, we have to understand that we do not have the privilege to shrink back when we see someone hurt, bullied, or mistreated. But we will have to have the audacity to stand with courage and fight for justice and in, in equality for all every step of the way. We will have to withhold our money from institutions that don't respect us. We will have to speak up when people are trying to shut us up. We will have to build a wealth legacy for our children and our children's children. We will have to sacrifice to feed the hungry and provide housing for the homeless. We will have to work to ensure that police discriminatory discriminatory practices become a thing of the past by all police. People, politicians, you don't have to clap, but it's something to clap for. People, poli people politicians, places, uh, media, and others might try to shoot us with fear by ap appealing health care, raising taxes on the middle class and the poor, and attacking our rights, whether that be women's rights, civil rights, or human rights. However, like our ancestors, we will have to sing, I'm not going to let anybody turn us around. And that is the antidote to any moral dysfunction and discrimination. It is love and resistance. We must resist and fight. And when we, we, and when we fight and resist, we must remember that we can't do it alone. But we will have to do it together. All ages, faith communities, ethnicities, genders, those with PhDs and no Ds. We will have to protest together. We will have to boycott together. We will have to speak up for and support each other when we see others being mistreated. We will have to refuse to bow down or to comp compromise with evil, demanding that all people are treated with dignity and equity. We will have to have the strength to resist so that we might make this world a better place. How many, I'm explaining it like this, how many of you all saw the movie uh, Black Panther? Some of you all, okay. 
And so one of my favorite scenes in the movie Black Panther was when M Ambuku, played by Winston Duke, king of Wakanda's neighboring tribe, interrupts T'Challa's coronation and opposes T'Challa place for the throne. And it's in this particular scene that as the fight commences, M'Baku quickly gains the upper hand. And it was in this, the battle's most darkest moment, that the would-be king stepmother, Ramonda, played by Angela Bassett, Asoror, uh, yells, T'Challa, show him who you are. And it was with the strength, not of Black Panther, but of that of the ancestors, and in who he was, he yells, I am Prince T'Challa, son of King T'Chaka. And it was with this declaration that, that offers T'Challa the strength to resist yeah. and defeat M'Baku that he might take his rightful place to the throne. And this morning, I stopped by today to tell someone that in this life, you will experience challenges. But like T'Challa, you have to resist. And you got to show the world who you are. Who, you, who are you? You are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Who are you? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. So show the world who you are. You are black and beautiful. You are caramel and captivating. You are vanilla and vibrant. So show the world who you are. Show the world who you are. You got a blog? Then go ahead and launch it. You got an idea? Go ahead and flesh it out. That gift that you got? Go ahead and use it. That education? Go ahead and obtain it. Violence? Go ahead and eradicate it. The new Jim Crow? Abolish it. Racism? Protest it. Your life? Illuminated. Show the world who you are. And I'm wondering if there's about 25 folks in here today who's willing to stand to their feet and say, I'm ready to show the world who I am. Is there anybody in here today that's ready to show the world who you are? If you're ready to show the world who you are, why don't you give the near neighbor a high five and say, baby, show the world who you are. Show the world who you are. Show the world who you are. Dr. King teaches us this. He teaches us that we, might, we must have the strength to love. Somebody say strength to love. Secondly, he teaches us this, that we must have the strength to resist. Somebody say strength to resist. But finally, his life and legacy teaches us this, that we must have the strength to act. Somebody say strength to act. In his last book in 1967, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, Dr. King warned that the movement was already hobbled by delusion. He said, and I quote, the majority of white Americans consider themselves sincerely committed to justice for the Negro. He wrote, and he goes on to say that, they believe that American society is essential, hospitable to fair play, and to steady growth toward a middle class utopia embodying racial harmony. But unfortunately, this is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity. In the past few years, we have witnessed some of the most darkest hours of America <clears throat> as we watch children being snatched away from their parents and housed in cages like animals, violated and neg negated, as we've seen misogyny and racism at an all-time high, and we have a government that sees life as pawns rather than people. This dark hour in America is not new. For the truth is, is that darkness has hovered over America throughout our history as light has barely shined through it. For what makes this, dark ti this time dark is, it, is the fact that the democracy, equal rights, and justice that have, uh, we have worked for, and particularly that King stood for, is on the cuffs 
of being stolen like a thief in the middle of the night because of the heart problem of America. Many people are still delusional and believe that things are not all that bad. But the truth is, is that things are dark and filled with confusion. So where do we go from here? How do we proceed in the midst of such chaos and when people seem to be so traumatized by hurt and fear and injustice? Shall we perpetuate the chaos or shall we cultivate community? Shall we live as a colorblind society or shall we celebrate diversity and inclusion? Shall we bully each other because of our own brokenness and insecurity? Or shall we love our neighbor fiercely? We have a choice today. And we should make the choice that King implores to cultivate a beloved community. And in order to cultivate a beloved community, there will have to be a change in the mental consciousness of people. We will have to have strategies to fight injustice, anxiety and apprehension and opposition and the insults and carry what Martin and others um, carried and what they were carry on what Martin and others were working on the next mile of the way. See, Dr. King understood that change was contingent upon people's ability to love and to act toward change. Thus, he mobilized people of a variety of backgrounds, belief, and ethnicities to demand equality for all of God's children. See, he knew real change could not materialize if people did not come together to work together for the common good of all and trust God through it all. So how will we move from chaos to community? I'm glad you asked. The community must prevail and act. We will have to take our power back and fight for the rights of all. We will have to stop drawing a line through the sand and have conversations with each other, regardless of our differences and disagreements. We will have to reach across our religion, division, or sexual orientation, race, and fight and resist the urge of self-preservation and just us and have the strength to overcome fear and act for justice for all and for generations to come. And we will also have to trump anything that will try to oppose injustice. We will have to commit to what King called the other America, those who are poor and those who had the ability to save this America. Beloved, it is fact that none of us in this room have the luxury to sit back. The poor and the rich must work together. The black, white, and brown people must work together. The educated must work together with the uneducated. The athlete must work with the tech. For Dr. King once said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. And in this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. Dr. King and many of our ancestors made our lives possible through sacrifice. They courageously gave up their lives and acted with courage because they hoped and they dreamed deep in their heart that the world and the universe leaned more toward justice and love for all. And as they used their lives to block for us so that we might experience a better world, uh, and they, uh, we too will need to block for others ourselves. Let me explain it like this. I believe it was Terrell Owens, the football player, was being interviewed by ESPN reporter. And the reporter during the interview was admonishing him because he dances in the end zone. 
So uh, Terrell Owens, or T.O. as he is called, he enters safely into the end zone, and oftentimes when he's in that end zone, he dances, and what he does is he dances, and then he begins to point. And so, and uh, T.O., as he called, he, he called him, he enters safely in this end zone, turns around and points at the people who were behind him, and this reporter thought it was unsportsmanlike conduct and said, how can you point and dance? It is uncouth and arrogant and shows no civility. T.O. stated, obviously, you've never played football. Only a person who has been hit, tackled, bruised, or broken. In other words, a person of privilege sitting in the stands making judgments could make such a statement. He went on to say, when you see me pointing, I'm not pointing to taunt the other team. I'm pointing to thank the people who blocked for me. He says, when I get into the end zone, I'm in a place where it is illegal for the enemy my opponent to hit, to harm, or to break me. So he said, when you see me point, I'm thanking the people who blocked for me and made a way for me. They took the hit for me. They were bruised for me. And if you paid attention, you will also notice that I begin by pointing at my blockers, but I always end up pointing upward, giving thanks unto my God. And as I close today, I too want to point to a few people who have blocked for us, who have took hits for us and tasted some strange fruit for us. I need to point to my ancestors. Sojourner, Sojourner Truth, thank you for blocking for us. Fannie Lou Hamer, thank you for blocking for us. Ella Baker, thank you for blocking for us. Bayard Rustin, thank you for blocking for us. Harold Washington, thank you for blocking for us. Rosa Parks, thank you for blocking for us. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., thank you for blocking for us. But there is someone else that I must thank on this day. The one that was bruised for my iniquity, that was broken so that we might be set free. The one who put me in the end zone at Cal Calvary. He is my guard. He is my tackle. He is the center of my joy. He is my end. He is my my beginning. He coordinates my, my offense by designing my defense. He calls the plays in my life. Can I call his name? Is there anybody in here that doesn't mind that if I call his name? His name is Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. He is a light. He is a way in the middle of a way. He is my mind regulator. He is my Jehovah Nisha. He is my Jehovah over Rafa. He is some that calls Mary's baby. Is there anybody in here besides myself that knows Jesus? Is there anybody in here besides myself that knows somebody by the name of Jesus? And because he blocked for us, because they blocked for us, we too can block for this next generation as we have the strength to love, the strength to resist, and the strength to act and change the world. We can do it. We can tear down the walls of division. We can ensure equity for all. We can fight together for now. We can. Yes, we can. We can do it. Somebody say, yes, we can. Yes, we can. We can do it because one day together, we will all way, all together say free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. God bless you. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Mighty, mighty, mighty apparent that mom and dad, you did some blocking too. Amen. God bless you. Pastor Andre, why don't you come on up, sir?
didn't we joy our dynamic speaker <laughs> wonderful wonderful job at this time i come to just acknowledge and congratulate all the people who work behind the scenes to make this breakfast possible and actually they are so humble that you can't even see them they're all the way to my far left but with the breakfast committee and uh, mlk committee would you guys just stand and be acknowledged Thank you so much for all you do. They do a wonderful job. And right before I bring one of our committee members up, Bobby Steele, we would like to also just acknowledge all the local elected officials and all of our, um, all of our first responders. Would you guys stand too? We appreciate having you here. Let's stand and thank you. All over. We want to honor you for your service because you two block for us, and so we do appreciate you. Bobby Steele, would you come? Good morning. Good morning. So I'd like to give an overview of additional events and opportunities to continue to celebrate Dr. King's legacy. Immediately after, con after the conclusion of the breakfast, we will have our unity march for the first time in two years. The weather permitted the today, so I expect to see all of us out there. So the march will leave the Multicultural Center starting on North Street and travel north to Schaefer Bell Tower, and we'll return back to the Multicultural Center on McKinley. We will provide pre-made signs for the march. You may exit the Student Center and go straight toward McKinley. The Multicultural Center is a two-story White House on the right, if you're unfamiliar with campus. We also ask that you would join us tomorrow, Tuesday, January 21st at 7.30 in Proust Hall for the MLK speaker. This year is Dr. Beverly Tatum. Dr. Tatum is President Emerita of Spelman College. She's also a clinical psychologist who's widely known for both her expertise on race relations and higher education. She spent 13 years as a college of, excuse me, as a president of Spelman College and we're marked by her innovation and growth. Her visionary leadership was also recognized by the Carnegie Academic Leadership Award. We also invite you to check out the Multicultural Center's Unity Weeks calendar for updates on other events Follow this week. Lastly, I'd like to share the history of the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice. Lift Every Voice and Sing, often referred to as the National Black Anthem, was written by James Weldon Johnson. And then it was also set to music by his brother, John Johnson, in 1899. It was first performed in, pu in public at the Johnson's hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, as part of the celebration of Lincoln's birthday on February 12, 1900. It was performed by a choir of 500 school children at the segregated Stanton School where James Weldon Johnson was principal. It has also been adopted by the NAACP as its official song. Today, Lift Every Voice and Sing is one of the most cherished songs in the African-American civil rights movement. We will also have, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Larry Emmons, who's associate pastor of, excuse me, uh, uh, Greater Second Baptist Church. He will join us for the second year in a row to recite the I Have a Dream speech performed by Dr. Martin Luther King. We will also follow by Mr. Emmons. We will have Megan Polliney and Governor Davis back to the stage to perform Lift Every Voice. Thank you for participating. I was looking for a handheld mic, <laughs> kind of get me out of the uh, comfort zone here. How's everybody doing today? It's good to be here on today. God is good, is that right? Amen, all the time. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. I'm from Marion, Indiana. I'm one of the associate pastor of the Greater Second Missionary Baptist Church under the leadership of Dr. Benny L. Powell, Sr. I'm just a country boy. I'm all the way from Mississippi. <laughs> I don't try to be anything that I'm not. I thank God for blessing me and keeping me and bringing me down through the highways and the byways. Amen, amen. All these great speakers. I don't have anything behind my name. 
<laughs> Amen. I said I'm from Mississippi. It's not where you're from. It's where you're going. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. Pastor Edward, you taught me a lesson today. I want my wife to come and stand behind me. <laughs> my wife is all the way from Detroit, Michigan. I couldn't find nobody in Marion that wanted me. <laughs> so I had to go all the way to Detroit. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> no, stand right here. She's been putting up with me for 27 years. I met her in Chicago, Illinois, at my brother church. She was sitting out in the audience, and I was preaching, kind of threw me for a loop. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for my good buddy over here, Perry. He said, now, nah, I don't want you to mess up. Put some pressure on me. So he thought. <laughs> Do y'all have a dream speech was given on August the 28th, 1963, in Washington, D.C., from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial? There was over 250,000 people that had come from all over the land and the country to hear this great man of God. I am happy to join with you today and what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five scores years ago, a great American in whom somebody's shadow we stand today signed the deed Emancipational Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been sealed it in the flame of wintering justice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end their long night of captivity. But we must face the tragic fact that 100 years later, Negroes are still not free. 100 years later, Negroes are still sadly crippled by the mannequin of segregation and by the change of discrimination. 100 years later, Negroes still live on a lonely island of poverty while in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, Negroes are still lingering in the corner of the American society where I found himself in exile in his own land. So we have come here today to dramatize an appalling condition. In a sense, we have come to our nation capital to catch a check. When the architect of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signed in a promissory note to which every American was to fall heirs. This note was a promise which guaranteed all men, yes, black men as well as white men, the inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that Americans have defaulted on this promissory note in so far as our citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, Americans have given the Negro people a bad check, a check which come back mob insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. Right. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in this great vault of opportunity of this nation. So we have come here today to catch a check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom 
and the security of justice. We've also come to this hollow spot to remind American of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off, nor to take the tranquilizing drug aggressivism. Now is the time. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and the desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit paths of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It will be fatal for our nation to overlook the urgency of the moment and to underestimate the determination of the Nook Road. This sweltering summer of the Nook Road logistic discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not the end, but the beginning. And those who hope that the Nook Road needed to blow off steam will now be content. We have a rude awakening if our nation return to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Nook Road is granted his or her citizenship right. The whirlwind of revolt will continue to shape the foundation of our nation until the bright day of justice emerge. But there is something I must say to my people today who stands on a warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice and the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrong for deed. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to disintegrate into physically violent. Again and again, we must ride to the majestic height of meeting physical force with soul force. This marvelous new militancy, which has engulfed the Negro community, must not lead us to a distrust of all white people, for many of our white brothers and sisters as evident by their presence here today. They have come to realize that their destiny is tied with our destiny. They have come to realize that their history is inextricably bound to our freedom. And we cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we will make the play that we will always march ahead. We cannot look back. There are those that are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We will never be satisfied as long as a Negro is a victim of unspeakable horror, police brutality. We will never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with fatigue or travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels in the highway and in the hotels in the city. We will never be satisfied as long as the Nook Road's small nobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We will never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We will never be satisfied as long as the Nook Road's in Mississippi are not able to vote and the Nook Road's in New York City believe they have nothing in which to vote for. I'm not mindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulation. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from area where your quest, quest for freedom left you staggering by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veteran of created suffering continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. 
Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to Georgia. Go back to the slums and the ghettos of the northern city, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. And I say to you today, my friend, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold the truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream today that one day on the red hill to Georgia, sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners one day be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream today that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, a state sweltering with the heat of oppression, will one day be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream today that one day my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today that one day, right there down in Alabama, with his vicious racist, with his governor lip drifting with the words of interproposition and nullification. One day right there down in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands together with little white boys and white girls and be able to walk together as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today that one day every valley will be exalted Every hill and mountain will be made low. The rough place we made plain, and the crooked place we made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the flesh shall see it together. This is my hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we'll be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a storm of hope. With this faith, we'll be able to transform the juggle and discourse of our nation and to a beautiful sympathy of brotherhood. With this faith, we'll be able to struggle together, go to jail together, stand for freedom together, knowing that one day all the God children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country, tears of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing, land where my father died. Land of the Pilgrim pride, from every mountainside let freedom reign. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom reign from the Bordillo Utah to New Hampshire. Let freedom reign from the mighty mountain of New York City. Let freedom reign from the curious slope of California. But not only that, let freedom reign from the stone mountain of Georgia. Let freedom reign from the lookout mountain of T Tennessee. From every mountainside, let freedom reign. And when we do that, when we allow freedom to reign from every city and every state, yes, from every hamlet and every village, we'll be able to speed up that day. Take somebody by the hand. We're all the God children. We'll be able to join hand and sing in the words of the old Nicholas spiritual song. Help me out here, somebody. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. God bless you today. I invite everyone to sing along with me. 
lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring ring with the harmony of liberty let all rejoicing rise high as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of a new day begun let us march on till victory Now it's time for the benediction. We thank you for coming. Two things. One, if you want to give to the scholarship, Mr. Beatty will take that. And we have two Afrocentric, African-American-centric newspapers that you can pick up on your way out. Let us bow our heads. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the freedom that we have in you. In Jesus' name, God bless us all. Amen.